Okay, good afternoon. I think we'll uh, get started. Now, uh, normally, so <laughs> you shouldn't be dissuaded by uh, the somewhat smaller audience than usually here. Uh, it's nothing personal, nothing having to do with the topic. It's probably the weather more than anything else. But normally, there are between two and 400 people who are online uh, listening and watching just at the NIH. And uh, then three days later, this program goes out on the NIH video archive where it's downloaded all around the world, uh, sometimes literally up into the thousands. So you have a global audience as well as a highly discriminatory audience that's, that's on site. So, uh, okay, so today's topic is hepatitis A and cRNA viruses, clinical and basic effects. And our two speakers, I'll briefly introduce them to you. Uh, Mark Ganny is a physician who graduated from uh, the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and then took special training at Duke, came to the NIH as a staff fellow in NIDDK in 1996, and since 2000 has been a staff clinician. Uh, Mark has established a substantial reputation for his knowledge, interest, experience, and studies uh, in clinical and therapeutic aspects of particularly hepatitis C. So our second speaker is uh, Nihal Alton Bonet, who got her PhD from Rockefeller, uh, and then came as a postdoctoral fellow. She was here in Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz's lab for approximately five years, uh, and then was on the faculty at uh, <coughs> Rutgers in New Jersey. And in 2013, uh, she became a Stedman Fellow winning one of these prestigious competitions. And so she has been here since 2013. Um, and she's the head of a laboratory of host and pathogen dynamics. Uh, Niho received one of the also prestigious presidential uh, awards, the Presidential Early Career Award in Science and Engineering and has received a Young Investigator Award from the Theobald Smith Society of the American Society of Microbiology. Uh, her interest, which you'll hear about, really closely links, apropos the bridge idea, uh, with the clinical diseases, uh, particularly these two, which are due to RNA viruses. So one of the things you might think about, for those who don't think about this particularly all the time, is here are two RNA viruses uh, that affect the liver. They differ greatly in their epidemiology, their clinical features, uh, the outcome, how you prevent them, and in treatment. Of interest is hepatitis A is in the bile and in the feces. Hepatitis C apparently is not. I've never been able to firmly know whether what the answer to that is, but most people tell me it's not. So how does that happen from two RNA viruses? What determines it? And then the area that Niho has discovered and explored with really uh, a great accomplishment, and we put the references and papers on the website, is how do RNA viruses remodel intracellular organelles and events that take place within the cell uh, to facilitate viral replication? What, what price does the cell pay, particularly if the cell is not going to die? And are these, are there common mechanisms uh, that are shared between RNA viruses and cells? And if so, could these possibly be common denominator targets even for, for therapy? 
Well, this is a whole brave new world that's just emerged within the period of the past four or five years, and Nihau has been really the ringleader in it. So we're very grateful to both of you, and Mark, perhaps you'd like to begin? Well, thanks, Wynn, for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, I'm delighted to okay, participate in this uh, symposium today. And um, as many of you all know, last night was a lunar eclipse, although uh, I'm sure everyone here in the room probably couldn't see it um, because of the cloud cover. But this is what we missed, um, beautiful red moon. So what I'd like to start with is uh, an overview of hepatitis A and hepatitis C viruses. And uh, Wynne has sort of alluded to some of the, the similarities and differences between them. Um, as he indicated, hepatitis A is transmitted uh, primarily uh, from stool, whereas hepatitis C through exposure to blood. And the route of transmission is enteric or um, intestinal in the case of hepatitis A, whereas in hepatitis C, um, it's through percutaneous or permucosal exposure. They're both associated with uh, acute hepatitis, and uh, uh, the number of infections uh, per year per 100,000 individuals in the United States are shown there on the slide. Hepatitis A accounts for slightly more cases than hepatitis C. And they've both been associated with uh, fulminant hepatitis, although this is a, a rare presentation for both uh, viruses. Um, hepatitis A causes about 100 deaths per year. Um, it's unclear uh, how many are due to uh, hepatitis C from fulminant hepatitis. Um, and hepatitis A uh, does not have the propensity to cause chronic hepatitis, but hepatitis C does. Um, hepatitis A is usually associated with a self-limiting infection, um, so it doesn't require any therapy, whereas the majority of cases of hepatitis C go on to develop chronic hepatitis, and therapies are available, and um, I'm going to discuss the new therapies uh, uh, later in my talk. There is an available vaccine for hepatitis A, but not for uh, hepatitis C. So I'm going to begin with giving an overview of hepatitis A, and then I'll transition to uh, hepatitis C. And then I'll be happy to take uh, any questions at the end. If you do have a burning question during the talk, please uh, interrupt me. I think we're a small enough group here that um, we can pause. So hepatitis A is actually an ancient uh, virus. Um, it's existed for centuries, and there have been references to um, epidemics of jaundice dating back to 7th, 8th centuries, and in fact, maybe even earlier in some of the uh, Chinese literature. It's still an important uh, cause of infectious uh, jaundice worldwide, but uh, it's usually associated with a self-limiting uh, hepatitis. But globally, there are about 1.5 million cases uh, annually. Here in the United States, there are about 1,400 cases of acute hepatitis A reported in 2011, and the CDC estimates that um, the true number may be double that uh, due to uh, the number of asymptomatic cases uh, that don't come to medical attention and due to uh, underreporting. So what I mean by that is uh, patients acquire hepatitis and then uh, recover spontaneously without uh, uh, medical intervention. Um, hepatitis A accounts for about 50% of all the reported cases of acute hepatitis uh, in the U.S. So uh, this slide shows the global prevalence of uh, hepatitis A. And as you can see, there is a distinct uh, pattern of the geographical distribution. And the prevalence and incidence of hepatitis A is strongly associated uh, with socioeconomic uh, conditions uh, around the globe, with um, uh, sanitation and hygiene of a particular uh, country, 
with uh, overcrowding and with access to uh, fresh drinking water. So um, you can see that the highest um, uh, prevalence is in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and uh, uh, the, the Asian subcontinent. Uh, intermediate uh, prevalence is in uh, Central and South America, North Africa, the Middle East and uh, Eastern uh, Europe, Eastern Asia. Um, and the lowest uh, prevalence is in North America, Western Europe, and Australia. So the epidemiology uh, is different amongst uh, uh, the different um, endemic regions. In highly endemic regions, most infections occur in children. And as a result, uh, there is a high herd immunity and, as a consequence, a low burden of disease. In, intimate, in, in intermediate areas of endemicity, most infections occur in adolescents and adults. Um, and there's less herd immunity, and as a consequence, um, epidemics of uh, hepatitis A uh, are more frequent. In low and very low areas of endemicity, uh, most infections occur in adolescents and adults who are at high risk uh, for the infection. And who are these individuals? Uh, injection drug users and travelers. And then finally, also in, uh, uh, during outbreaks of hepatitis A that occur sporadically. So uh, shown in this uh, uh, slide here is a cartoon of the genomic organization of the virus. Hepatitis A, as you've heard, is a, a member of the picornovirus family and has its own genus, uh, hepatovirus. So the, it's a single strand, RNA, non-enveloped uh, uh, positive sense uh, virus of about 7.5 kilobase pairs. Uh, but there's some Recent data from Stan Lemon's uh, lab to suggest actually that envelope virus can be detected uh, only in blood, not in stool, and that this envelope virus uh, is infectious. But uh, Altan is probably going to discuss this in her talk, so I won't uh, discuss this uh, any further. Um, <clears throat> so there's a single open reading frame uh, that uh, translates for a polyprotein of about 2,200 amino acids. And this is uh, cleaved by viral proteases into the functional, structural, and non-structural proteins, which then assemble uh, to form uh, the intact uh, virion. So there are seven genotypes of hepatitis A, but only four of which affect humans, one, two, three, and seven. And there's only uh, one uh, serotype. As I mentioned, uh, uh, there are different routes of uh, transmission. Hepatitis A, the major route of transmission is through the fecal-oral route, uh, through person-to-person -person spread, from intrafamilial spread or intra-institutional uh, spread. Percutaneous and sexual transmission have been reported, but these are really uh, rare uh, uh, forms of transmission, except in uh, uh, men who have sex with men, uh, where there have been uh, noted outbreaks of uh, hepatitis A. So what about the clinical features of the viral infection? The incubation period, the average incubation period is about 28 days with a range of 15 to 50 days. And the clinical manifestations include uh, a mild febrile illness with, uh, accompanied with malaise, uh, anorexia or loss of appetite, nausea, uh, mild abdominal discomfort, and then usually followed in a few days by uh, jaundice. And the severity of illness uh, increases with age. So in younger individuals, it's usually a mild subclinical infection. But as you get older, um, uh, you're more likely to develop uh, jaundice and symptoms of the infection. So this slide shows uh, an example of the clinical course of the infection. So following uh, ingestion of the virus, uh, it's uh, uh, transported from the GI tract uh, to the liver where replication occurs and then the virus is excreted in, in bile. Uh, in the incubation, in the late incubation phase uh, to the um, preclinical uh, uh, phase, that is the preecteric phase, virus can be detected in liver, in, uh, in the blood, uh, in the bile, and in stool. And in, the, in fact, um, the virion level may reach 10 to the 9 copies uh, in stool per gram of uh, stool. So what this means is that 
individuals are actually most infectious when they are subclinical. Um, so that's why the virus is able to, to be propagated. Once jaundice ensues, the level of uh, viremia in blood and stool diminishes markedly, and so does uh, infectivity. Antibody to hepatitis A is usually not detected until um, uh, jaundice is, uh, is present. So there are five clinical patterns of presentation that have been identified. Uh, asymptomatic, symptomatic with jaundice that's self-limiting to less than uh, eight weeks with uh, spontaneous recovery. Um, some individuals may present with a cholestatic phase with a prolonged duration of jaundice lasting 10 weeks, but again, recovery is the rule. And then there's this intriguing presentation of a relapsing hepatitis consisting of one, consisting, sorry, of two or more bouts of acute hepatitis A infection occurring over a six to 10 week period. And this occurs in about 10% of individuals. Now, notably, the second bout of, uh, of infection is usually milder compared to the first uh, episode. It's unclear what's, uh, what causes this uh, variable presentation of the infection, whether this is uh, related to different genotypes or host response to the virus is unclear. And it really hasn't been uh, researched very well because it's not a common presentation of the infection. And then finally, fulminant hepatitis, uh, which is a rare form occurring in um, generally about 1%, but less than 5% of cases. So there, there, there is an IgM response. And actually, um, with the second phase, levels of IgM may actually uh, go up again, increase again. So there, there is an immune response. So outcome, as I mentioned, uh, recovery is the rule, and chronic infection uh, does not occur. There may be prolonged uh, course lasting six months or more, but all individuals uh, either die or recover. Um, because the virus doesn't cause a, a chronic infection, no treatment is required, and uh, generally just supportive care is necessary uh, to get patients uh, uh, through the convalescent phase. So there is a specific prevention available for uh, hepatitis A. Uh, there's passive prevention through administration of uh, serum immunoglobulin or active uh, prevention through administration of uh, vac vaccine. And there are two inactivated uh, vaccines for hepatitis A, Havrix and uh, Vactor. And both of these uh, vaccines, after one dose, yield um, Significant uh, protection against infection in more than 90 to 95 percent of individuals after the first dose. And after a, a second dose six months later, um, 98 to 99 percent of individuals um, uh, develop uh, protective levels of antibody. As far as durability of vaccine is concerned, um, it's estimated that the uh, vaccine should be uh, durable for up to 20 to 25 uh, years. Uh, based on uh, our current knowledge. So um, in the United States, uh, vaccination was uh, recommended in 1996 for uh, areas of the country that were associated with a high prevalence of uh, hepatitis A, mostly uh, Western states and Alaska. And then a decade later in 2006, uh, hepatitis A vaccination was recommended uh, for uh, all uh, school age uh, kids. And what I'd like to point out here is you can see the dramatic uh, decline in the incidence of uh, hepatitis C, um, first through uh, improved uh, hygiene, and then really um, in the last, uh, from 1996 with the introduction of vaccination, uh, and then to 2006 with mandatory vaccination, there's been a 95% reduction in the incidence of acute hepatitis A uh, since the introduction of vaccine in the United States. And in addition, uh, the disparity in, um, <clears throat> in prevalence of acute hepatitis A in the United States has declined uh, dramatically with the introduction of uh, vaccination. So you can see here, um, data from 1987 to 97, 
the, the marked uh, disparity between uh, Western and Eastern states uh, to 2007 following the introduction of vaccination where uh, acute hepatitis A has essentially been you know, eliminated except for sporadic uh, uh, regions of the US. So finally, uh, who should be vaccinated for hepatitis A? As I mentioned, uh, all kids between uh, ages of 2 and 18 uh, should receive uh, vaccination. Uh, international travelers <clears throat> traveling to areas where the uh, virus is uh, endemic. Uh, for persons who anticipate close contact with an international adoptee, uh, men who have sex with men, uh, illicit uh, drug users, uh, persons with uh, chronic liver disease, uh, persons receiving clotting factor concentrates, persons who work with uh, hepatitis A infected primates or in the uh, research setting, and then finally, anyone who wishes to obtain uh, immunity. So um, this is my uh, transition slide, and it shows you the, the, the lunar eclipse uh, transitioning coming out of uh, the, the, the Earth's shadow. And this is a picture that was taken in uh, the Canary Islands in uh, Tenerife. So for the remainder of the talk now, I'm going to uh, focus on uh, hepatitis C. And uh, uh, this is another RNA virus. And it's estimated that there are about 170 to 200 million persons with chronic infection uh, worldwide. worldwide sorry. It's a major cause of chronic liver disease, cirrhosis, end-stage liver disease, and cancer uh, globally. Here in the US, it's the leading indication for adult liver transplants. And I'll show you some data now uh, that death from hepatitis C now exceeds that of uh, HIV. Uh, unlike hepatitis A, there's no vaccine or specific prevention available. And therapy is problematic and effective in only a proportion of patients. But uh, uh, therapy for hepatitis C is uh, rapidly improving. And uh, we can now achieve uh, cures in about 90% of uh, individuals. And I'll show you some of that data uh, later in the talk. So this slide shows uh, the global distribution of, uh, of hepatitis C infection. As I mentioned, it's a major cause of uh, cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma uh, and is therefore a major uh, uh, cause of disease burden uh, worldwide. So um, highlighted uh, here by the arrows are the prevalence rates of hepatitis C in uh, the six most populous countries uh, in the world. And uh, if you take these six most populous countries, including Egypt, they account for half the cases of hepatitis C uh, globally. Um, now, the true estimate of disease burden has been difficult to determine uh, because of uh, inadequate uh, surveillance data. Um, even in population-based studies, such as NHANES, these studies have uh, undersampled uh, high-risk groups. And in other countries, most of the surveillance data has come from uh, blood donors and uh, pregnant uh, women studies. So uh, the WHO actually suggests that the true uh, disease, the true infection burden of hepatitis C may be double the number of 200 million because of uh, underreporting. So this is a significant um, uh, problem, health problem. So uh, the genomic organization of the virus is shown here. Uh, hepatitis C is a positive stance, single-stranded RNA virus of about uh, 9.6 kilobase pairs. Um, it encodes a single uh, open reading frame. Uh, that encodes for a number of uh, different uh, viral proteins. And this, um, this polyprotein undergoes uh, uh, co- and post-translational cleavage by both host and cellular, uh, host and viral proteases to yield uh, the structural and non-structural proteins. The viral proteins that are highlighted in red, the serine protease, the NS5A uh, protein, and the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase are currently the targets of major drug uh, development uh, programs. Now, I would like to mention that the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase lacks proofreading capacity, and as a consequence, the virus circulates uh, as a, uh, 
a viral swarm or, or quasi-species. Um, but a number of uh, uh, genotypes uh, have been um, determined, that there are six genotypes based on a, a sequence divergence of 30% among isolates and 20% among subtypes. Uh, worldwide, genotype 1 is the most common um, genotype, and here in the United States, genotype 1A is the most common uh, subtype, accounting uh, genotype 1 accounts for 70% of infections in the United States, and 1A accounts for about 80% of those. Uh, genotype 2 is most common in, uh, in Japan and, uh, and Taiwan. Genotype 3 in uh, the Indian subcontinent and uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Genotype 4 is predominantly found in Egypt and uh, uh, the Middle East. Genotype 5 in South Africa, and then genotype 6 in uh, Thailand and uh, Vietnam. So the clinical importance of genotype uh, relates to its response to, uh, to therapy. And now with the new direct-acting antiviral agents, we're also finding out that there are differences in uh, subtype. And I'll uh, get back to this uh, later in the talk. So if we look at the attributable fraction of cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma due to hepatitis C infection worldwide, we can see that uh, about, 20, about a quarter of cases of cirrhosis and liver cancer can be attributed to uh, hepatitis C uh, infection. And in terms of global mortality, uh, both hepatitis B and hepatitis C together uh, now account for about now uh, cirrhosis and death from liver disease related to hepatitis C and hepatitis B uh, is now the 12th leading cause of death uh, globally. And just for comparison, I put in two other infectious agents, uh, tuberculosis and HIV, uh, to uh, show you how um, it, it compares to uh, hepatitis C. So hepatitis C, the, the epidemic or epidemiology of the disease is changing in the United States, uh, as shown here on this slide. And the incidence of uh, chronic infection peaked somewhere in the early uh, 1990s and is now on the decline. So that's the good news. The bad news is that uh, estimates based on modeling of the number of individuals who are, who are projected to develop a cirrhosis are not expected to peak until the mid-2020s or 2030. And left untreated, a significant proportion of these individuals uh, will be at risk for developing complications of their disease, including uh, death. And indeed, as you can see here on this slide that shows the annual age-adjusted mortality rates from hepatitis B and hepatitis C and HIV infections in the United States between the period of 1999 and 2010, that in 2007, hepatitis C has surpassed HIV as a cause of death in the United States. So um, what are the major sources of infection? Well, globally, um, blood transfusion from unscreened donors, uh, injection drug use, unsafe therapeutic injections, and uh, other healthcare-related procedures account for the majority of uh, infections. But the routes of transmission vary depending on the prevalence of infection. So if you look at the yellow bar, the orange bars, sorry, pardon me, <laughs> the yellow bars, which indicate uh, areas of a uh, high endemicity, the major routes of transmission are household, nosocomial, and transfusion. Uh, whereas in areas of low endemicity, shown by the blue bars, injection drug use, sexual transmission, and occupational exposure account for the majority of uh, infections. I'd like to point out that perinatal uh, transmission rates uh, are the same in both endemic and uh, uh, low endemic areas, and actually account for about 50,000 cases of hepatitis C annually. And uh, we really have no way of interrupting uh, maternal infant uh, transmission. So this slide shows the uh, sources of infection in persons with acute hepatitis C in the U.S. And as you can see, um, here in the U.S., in drug, injection drug use accounts for slightly over half the number of acute cases of hepatitis C, followed by uh, uh, sexual transmission and nosocomial transmission. 
hepatitis C transmission from uh, receipt of blood products has largely been eliminated uh, through uh, screening uh, using uh, surrogate markers uh, prior to the introduction of a test for hepatitis C. And then since testing has been available through first antibody and now nucleic acid testing. So the chance of acquiring uh, hepatitis C from a blood transfusion in the US is now uh, less than getting struck by lightning. So let me turn now to the clinical features. Um, the incubation period is double that of uh, hepatitis uh, A. It's about eight weeks with a range of two to 26 weeks. And the clinical presentation for all intents and purposes is indistinguishable from that of uh, hepatitis A. And it includes uh, malaise, loss of appetite, nausea, abdominal discomfort, uh, followed by jaundice. Now, I, I would like to, um, uh, to, to note that um, presentation with jaundice is a very uncommon presentation of uh, hepatitis C. And the majority of individuals are asymptomatic uh, when they acquire their infection. So this slide shows the clinical course. Uh, following exposure to the virus, uh, the viral uh, RNA can be detected as early as uh, two weeks. Um, <clears throat> in contrast, antibody is not detectable until about six or eight weeks after uh, exposure. Um, in cases, uh, usually um, ALT levels don't peak until uh, jaundice is uh, evident, and ALT levels can peak up to 15 to 20 uh, times uh, normal. But as I mentioned, uh, this presentation is atypical, and the majority of individuals present with an asymptomatic course. So in contrast to uh, hepatitis A, there are only three clinical patterns that have been identified, the asymptomatic presentation, which is the majority of cases, symptomatic presentation with jaundice, which occurs in about 20% of individuals, and fulminant hepatitis is a rare, occurring in only about 1% to 3% of cases. There are a number of extrahepatic manifestations that can occur with uh, hepatitis C, and these can be broadly categorized as immune complex mediated uh, uh, disease or non-immune complex mediated. With the immune complex mediated, these include essential mixed cryoglobulinemia, membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, uh, B cell lymphoma, and uh, monoclonal gammopathy of uh, uncertain significance. In terms of the non-immune complex mediated presentations, these include Sjogren's, uh, lichen planus, porphyria cutanea tardia, and, uh, uh, and diabetes. So let me turn now to the natural history of a hepatitis C infection. And uh, following exposure uh, to the virus and acute infection, resolution occurs in about uh, 25 to 45 percent of individuals. Resolution occurs more commonly in uh, young individuals, in women, and persons uh, with IL-28B genotype CC. IL-28B encodes uh, for interferon uh, lambda. Um, but the majority of individuals uh, progress to chronic infection, and about 20 to 30 percent of individuals are at risk for progression to cirrhosis over a period of about 25 to 30 years, but progression to cirrhosis is not inevitable and depends on the presence or absence of additional risk factors, which I'll discuss in the next slide. Once cirrhosis develops, uh, hepatic decompensation occurs at a rate of about 3 to 5 percent per year, and hepatocellular carcinoma at about 1 to 4 percent uh, per year. So what are the factors that affect uh, the, uh, the uh, outcome of chronic infection? Uh, there are a number of factors that have been identified, uh, older age of infection, longer duration of infection, male gender, uh, alcohol use, uh, obesity, uh, underlying diabetes or insulin resistance, steatosis or steatohepatitis, co-infection with other viruses such as HIV or hepatitis B, um, IL-28B genotype CC, and higher ALT levels. So let me turn now to uh, screening. And uh, screening for hepatitis C is really the first step on the road to a cure for this disease. And once um, an individual is identified as being at risk for hepatitis C, 
uh, the first step is to test that individual. Individuals who test positive for hepatitis C then need to be counseled about transmission of the virus to others and about uh, preventing harm uh, to themselves. The patients must be assessed uh, for the need for treatment and risks and benefits of treatment discussed uh, with the, the patient. And finally, um, after this long journey, a proportion of patients uh, will be cured of their infection. So who should be screened? Uh, persons who've injected uh, illicit drugs in the recent or remote past. Persons with conditions associated with a high prevalence of infection, including those with HIV. Persons with hemophilia who received clotting factor concentrates prior to 87. Persons who've ever been on hemodialysis and those with abnormal uh, liver enzymes. Prior recipients of transfusions or organ transplants prior to 1992. Uh, children born to HCV-infected mothers, as I mentioned. Uh, healthcare, emergency medical, and public safety workers after needle stick injury or mucosal exposure to HCV-infected blood. Current sexual partners of HCV-infected persons. And finally, uh, the latest recommendation from the CDC uh, individuals born between the period 1945 and 65, the so-called birth cohort. So what are the, uh, what are the risk uh, factors uh, associated with infection for hepatitis C? I've sort of discussed this, and this is data from the CDC uh, showing screening, screening criteria for hepatitis C in the general population and how well it works. And this is a somewhat busy slide, but I'd like you to just focus your attention to the areas that are highlighted in orange. So if you take individuals age, ages between 20 and 50 <coughs> and look at three risk factors, that is injection drug use, a history of blood transfusion before 1992, and greater than 20 sexual uh, lifetime, uh, greater than 20 lifetime sex partners, you can see that with those three risk factors, uh, you can capture about 90% uh, of individuals who um, have chronic hepatitis C. And about a third of the population would have these risk factors. So you have to screen a fair number of the population to identify these individuals. If you add a fourth risk factor, that is an elevated ELT level, you can now identify almost 99% of individuals with chronic infection. And about 40%, you'd have to screen about 40% of the population. If you look at a slightly uh, older age group, that is age 60, the risk factors for acquisition of infection are a little different. In these individuals, the, the greatest risk factor is transfusion before 1992 and having an abnormal ALT level. With these two factors alone, you would capture about 88% of the infected individuals and have to screen about 21% of the population. So on the surface, Risk-based screening would seem to be a very effective strategy for identifying persons with hepatitis uh, C. But unfortunately, um, uh, that has not uh, been uh, the case in practice. And a significant proportion of persons with chronic hepatitis C remain undiagnosed. Now, here in the US, about 50% of persons with chronic infection are unaware of their um, status. And you can see that uh, the proportion of uh, persons who are unaware of their, their status varies uh, markedly. Um, France has the highest rates of detection, uh, about 55%. Uh, but even in countries uh, in, in, in uh, Western Europe, um, as many as 90% uh, of individuals are unaware of their diagnosis. So this is a problem. Um, and the CDC uh, recognized this the limited effectiveness of risk-based screening, and that together with the fact that HCV morbidity and mortality is increasing, as the data I showed you earlier, and the fact that treatment is improving, the, the CDC now uh, has come out with this birth cohort screening recommendations. And specifically, the recommendation states that all persons born between 1945 and 1965 should be tested at least once uh, for hepatitis C. In this particular population, the prevalence of anti-HCV is about three and a quarter percent. And this accounts for about three quarters of the total anti-HCV prevalence uh, here in the United States. 
Now, I would like to stress that, uh, that both cohort screening uh, does not replace risk factor-based screening. And this should still be um, part of uh, your, your practice. So now for the remainder of the talk, I'd like to just focus on uh, the treatment of uh, hepatitis C, because there's been major advancements uh, here, and uh, the landscape is uh, changing really very, uh, at a very rapid uh, pace. So first, let me begin by what are the goals of our treatment. And the goals are really uh, quite simple, to prevent the complications of the disease, that is cirrhosis, end-stage liver disease, liver cancer, and liver-related death. This is difficult to show in uh, epidemiologic uh, studies, so um, we use a surrogate endpoint, which is the sustained virological response after stopping uh, therapy. So this cartoon illustrates the outcomes of therapy for hepatitis C. And if you look at the, the red line, this indicates an individual who becomes a negative on treatment and remains negative 12 weeks at the end of uh, therapy. This is called a sustained biological response and is the surrogate marker that we use for efficacy of uh, therapy. I'd also like to point out to you that individuals who fail therapy are really a heter heterogeneous group of people and include people who fail to ever clear the virus, individuals uh, who experience uh, an on-treatment response and then breakthrough, and then persons who relapse after treatment is uh, discontinued. So what about uh, the sustained virological response? Is this really a cure? Well, I think of this as a virological cure in that nearly 100% of individuals who achieve this endpoint remain undetectable during long-term follow-up ranging from four to eight years. But I say virological cure, and that is because individuals with advanced disease may still be at risk for complications of their disease. And uh, this is data from a large uh, NIH-sponsored uh, trial uh, looking at uh, uh, the improved outcomes in patients with hepatitis C um, with advanced fibrosis who are able to achieve an SVR shown in uh, the blue bars compared to those individuals who fail to achieve an SVR. And what you can see here is that individuals who achieved an SVR and who had advanced fibrosis, they had a tenfold reduction in uh, rates of decompensated liver disease, uh, need for liver transplantation, and liver-related death. Um, individuals, the, the reduction, risk reduction in uh, liver cancer was not as great, uh, but was, was still uh, markedly uh, significant compared to those individuals who failed to achieve an SVR. But more importantly, there's now uh, recent data showing that SVR is associated with improved uh, survival. Um, and this is a retrospective analysis of over 500 patients with chronic hepatitis C with advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis who received an interferon-based uh, treatment between 1990 and 2003 and who were followed for a median of uh, about eight and a half years for all-cause mortality as well as liver-related mortality. And what I show you here is all-cause mortality. And what you can appreciate is that individuals uh, with SVR had about a three-fold reduction in all-cause mortality compared to those individuals who did not achieve an SVR. But I'd like to point out here uh, that individuals who achieved an SVR uh, were not uh, uh, completely uh, risk-free. And about 9% of individuals uh, uh, developed complications of disease over 10 years, so roughly uh, 1% uh, per year. And the major um, complication that these individuals developed was liver cancer. So even individuals who clear virus but have cirrhosis need to continue to be monitored for the development of cancer. So let me turn now to therapy. What is the optimal therapy for genotype 1? It's the combination of peganeferon and ribavirin. Uh, combined with a direct acting antiviral, either uh, sofosfavir, which is a NS5B or polymerase inhibitor, or uh, semiprovir, which is a NS34A or protease inhibitor. The expected response rates uh, with the sofosfavir containing regimen in genotype 1 patients is about 90%, and with the semiprovir containing regimen, uh, 
80 to 82 percent. So pretty high uh, response rates in genotype 1. But um, as I mentioned, there's been uh, remarkable um, improvements in the development of new treatments uh, for hepatitis uh, C. And um, the field is moving away from uh, interferon-based uh, treatments to interferon-free uh, uh, therapy. And this is uh, very recent data uh, on the completion of a phase of three phase three trials uh, evaluating an NS5 uh, uh, B inhibitor, so Fosfavir, with an NS5A replication complex inhibitor, Ledipasvir, either with or without ribavirin in treatment in patients who've never been treated or patients who've previously been treated. <clears throat> in the first, um, in the first uh, study, which looked at patients who'd never been treated, the regimen that was evaluated was uh, sofosfavir plus ledipasvir as a fixed dose uh, uh, preparation, so one tablet once a day, either with or without ribavirin for 12 or 24 weeks. And what you can see here is that if you just focus on the 12-week regimen, you can see that there was no benefit of adding ribavirin. That's shown in the, the orange bars, either at uh, and also, in, uh, there was no, um, there was not much more benefit of a 12-week regimen of a 24-week regimen over a 12-week regimen, and consistently high rates of uh, response were also seen in patients who had previously been treated and failed. 94% um, with the fixed dose regimen for 12 weeks, 99% uh, with the fixed dose regimen for uh, 24 weeks. Again, no real advantage of adding uh, ribavirin. Um, there was a third study done uh, comparing an eight-week regimen to a 12-week uh, regimen. And you can see, if you just focus on the eight-week regimen, that just the two drugs administered once daily for eight weeks had comparable uh, efficacy as that of a regimen containing ribavirin and also comparable efficacy to a 12-week. So individuals uh, who do not have cirrhosis, never been treated, eight-week regimen, you can cure over 90% of individuals. Here's data from another, uh, another study evaluating a different regimen. This is a five-drug regimen containing a NS3-4A protease inhibitor that's ritonavir boosted in combination with an NS5A replication complex inhibitor, ABT267 together with ABT333, which is a non-nucleoside uh, polymerase inhibitor in combination with ribavirin in treatment naive or experienced patients. You can see in both naive and experienced patients, 96% uh, success rate and uh, highly effective in both genotypes 1A and 1B. Um, studies were also done in the most difficult to treat individuals, those with cirrhosis and showed uh, very high rates of response, 92 weeks with a 12-week, 92% with a 12-week regimen, and 96% uh, with a 24-week um, uh, regimen. Let me turn now to therapy for genotypes uh, 2 and 3. Uh, here, there's an already an oral approved, uh, an all oral approved uh, regimen containing consisting of sofosfavir plus ribavirin, but 12 weeks for genotype 2, 24 weeks for genotype 3. And um, I'll just show you the data because of uh, interest of time. The overall, uh, the, the study compared uh, this all oral regimen to the standard, what was the standard of care, PEG plus ribavirin. Uh, it was a non-inferiority design study, and you can see the study met non-inferiority, 67% uh, uh, SVR rate in both arms, but I'd like you to notice the marked uh, difference in SVR rate between genotype 2 and 3 patients. With the sofosfavir ribavirin regimen, it was 95% in genotype 2 as compared to only 56% in genotype 3. And if you drill down uh, and look a little closer, you can see that uh, amongst genotype 2 patients with or without cirrhosis, SVR rates were quite high, above 90%, but Genotype 3 patients with cirrhosis, only a third of these individuals were able to be cured with a 12-week regimen. So the company um, actually conducted a 24-week regimen, and the data are shown here, 
And by extending therapy to 24 weeks uh, in treatment naive patients without cirrhosis, you could achieve a 94% success rate. And even in patients with cirrhosis who had previously been untreated, 92% of individuals uh, could be cured of their infection. Amongst treated, previously treated patients, um, high, high success rates were achieved in those without cirrhosis, uh, but in those individuals with cirrhosis, only 60% were able to be cured of their infection. So the genotype 3 patient with cirrhosis is now the most difficult or challenging patient to treat with uh, hepatitis C. So just to sum up the advantages of therapy that's, that, that's uh, probably going to be approved uh, in the next uh, six months, uh, we have the opportunity for once daily dosing, high potency, shorter duration of therapy, maybe as short as eight weeks, simpler regimens uh, that don't require response-guided therapy, very little adverse events, and interferon and perhaps ribavirin-free regimens. So this is my last slide, just to show you the success or progress that we've made in therapy of uh, hepatitis C. When I entered the field, um, you know, back in the, the early 90s, we could only cure about 6% of individuals. The first uh, 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 big uh, development was the addition of ribavirin to the regimen, where we were able to uh, increase response rate to about 42%. Um, and then the next uh, 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 incremental increase was the introduction of pegylated interferon. And then about just two years ago, two and a half years ago, was uh, the first direct-acting antiviral, uh, bosiprevir and telaprevir were approved, which uh, took SVR rates up into the 66 to 75% range. And now, in 2014, we can cure 90 to 100% of individuals with chronic hepatitis C. And the challenge moving forward now really is, as I mentioned, how to identify the significant number of persons with hepatitis C who are unaware of their diagnosis, um, how to get these people into care, and finally, treatment of uh, special populations, such as those with HIV co-infection and renal failure um, and children. So with that, I'll stop and be happy to take any questions. <clears throat> Uh, are there any questions you would like to ask? Sure. Um, one of my questions was um, the cost difference between the new DAAs and the, um, the ribavirin drug treatment, especially given that most of this population are drug users. Um, I was kind of curious as to your take on, yes, perhaps the drugs are working better, but what is what will be the advantages in terms of are there any disadvantages, I guess, in terms of cost? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. You must have read the recent editorial in the New England Journal uh, by um, Jay Hofnagel and uh, Avril Shoker, um, which uh, highlights the cost. So I, I didn't mention cost in the talk, but um, so Fosfavir um, costs $1,000 a pill. Um, and if you have to take it for 12 weeks, that works out to be about $84,000. Um, so previously, um, a significant proportion of patients with hepatitis C couldn't be treated because therapy was just so intolerable. And that's why the large proportion of patients with hepatitis C weren't treated. Only selected individuals who could tolerate therapy could be treated. Now, we have treatments that are highly effective, safe, very little side effects, but very costly. So I think your question is very apropos, uh, and that the majority of individuals with this infection are from lower income uh, stratas in the society. And how are we going to get here to these individuals? And I think that's a challenge that uh, the healthcare profession is going to be faced with. And I'm not actually sure how we're going to do that. Um, I did attend a, a meeting a couple of weeks ago um, 
with the organization uh, in Europe that's trying to provide care for uh, areas of the world where um, they certainly can't afford to pay for this. And we discussed different strategies, but it's going to take, uh, you know, it's going to take uh, collaboration from our industry partners and from um, uh, third-party payers to be able to bring down costs. And what we hope is that uh, with some of these different regimens, that competition is going to drive down costs. But that's not a, a guarantee. Um, but, but to get back to your question about inject, injection drug users, I mean, if we want to try to target, um, you know, uh, spread of this disease, that's obviously a population that you would want to target uh, because they account for the majority of infections. And uh, since there's no vaccine available, if you can uh, eradicate virus in that population, you can actually probably uh, cut down the majority of uh, acute infections that are occurring. So, so is there still interest in trying to develop a hepatitis C vaccine? Or have uh, the vaccine people stepped aside and invested in uh, pills? So um, there is still interest in, uh, in, in, in vaccines, especially for populations like injection drug users, where, as you know, they can get reinfected if they get re-exposed because um, uh, immunity is not, uh, you don't have um, a sterilizing immunity. So um, there are still groups working on it, uh, but they're working not as a prevention, but as uh, they're working on T-cell vaccines to try to ameliorate the course of disease and hopefully uh, uh, prevent chronic infection. Okay, I think that... Uh, the different genotypes that you mentioned, like the four and the five, six of, a, uh, of the HCV in your early slides, how do these drugs that are present right now, do you think they would be effective uh, with those genotypes? Or uh, are there differences in the RNA polymerase that... Uh... So that, that, that's a great question. Um, so with the uh, sofosavir plus ribavirin plus interferon regimen, uh, for 12 weeks, uh, genotypes 4, 5, and 6 were tested there uh, in very small numbers, less than, uh, altogether less than about 40 patients, and showed uh, high SVR rates, uh, more than 95% amongst those genotypes. Um, how the all oral regimens will, be, will perform in those genotypes is unclear. Now, the NS5B polymerase uh, is uh, pangenotypic. Um, so it should theoretically work for all genotypes. And um, it also has a high barrier to resistance because mutations in the polymerase are not tolerated. And actually, in the, the three phase three studies that I talked about there, all the failures were examined for presence of resistant mutations to the uh, NS5B agent, and it could not be detected, suggesting that mutations aren't tolerated, and if they do appear, they disappear very quickly. Um, now, with some of the other agents, uh, the, uh, these agents were really developed for genotype 1 infection, and their efficacy in other genotypes uh, may not be as well as genotype 1. Um, there's some preliminary data to, to suggest that they're still effective in genotype 4, but there's no data in genotype 5 and 6. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark. I think uh, Nihal is here. Thanks, Mark, uh, for the introduction, and thanks, Wynn, for inviting me to give a talk. So we can go until 5.30, right? That's the 5.30? No, that's fine. I, I, my presentation is relatively short. So, um, so I'm going to kind of switch gears and talk to you folks about uh, um, uh, what these, how these viruses replicate within cells and what happens to the cells in which they replicate. And uh, by knowing what happens to the cells in which they replicate and what these viruses need from the cells in which they replicate, can we um, think of therapeutic strategies, novel therapeutic stra strategies. And uh, the work that we do in my lab upstairs on the second floor of this building isn't really just focused on 
hepatitis A or, or C, and maybe that's good because uh, otherwise I would be out of business right now that I'm focusing on other virus, viruses as well. Do we have a pointer? Oh, where, where's the pointer? Pointer. Oh, in the drawer. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay, so we work with a, a variety of viruses in the lab, uh, um, and pretty much. Thank you. Uh, eighty percent, seventy-five, eighty percent of the viruses that we study in the lab fall into this category of uh, single positive strand RNA viruses. And so for those of you who may not be familiar, um, RNA is the genome of, this vi of these viruses. It's a single RNA molecule genome. Can be anywhere from 8,000 bases to 20, 25,000 bases. And the, what we mean by positive strand is simply that when this RNA, viral RNA genome goes into the cytoplasm, of a cell, it can be read by the cell's ribosomes and converted into um, viral protein machinery and viral structural proteins to make up the envelope and capsids of the virus. So about 80% of the viruses in the lab we study fall into this category, and the rest fall into the single negative strand RNA virus category. Okay, very similar, but it's a negative strand, and so those viruses need to bringing a little bit of extra machinery with them in order to get going in the cell. Their genomes aren't immediately read by the ribosomes. So back to the single positive strand RNA viruses, th this category of viruses uh, make up a significant amount of the disease-causing viral pathogens on our planet uh, for humans, as well as animals. And they include uh, hepatitis C and hepatitis A, as you've heard from Mark. And they include other ones like poliovirus, rhinovirus, which is a causative agent of the common cold, West Nile virus, dengue virus, um, yellow fever virus, so forth. So there are numerous human and animal pathogens that are part of this um, category. And all of these viruses, which are RNA viruses, have relatively small genome size relative to DNA viruses. Um, and typically, the single genome of these viruses, even though it's small, it's packed with enzymatic functions. Okay? So a single genome encodes, say, one protein, about 250 kilodaltons, take poliovirus, for example, that's translated initially into a 250 kilodalton protein, which then gets cleaved into two halves, which each get cleaved into further pieces, and so on and so on, until you end up from the 250 kilodalton, you end up about 12 proteins with various sizes. And what's remarkable is that in that process of cleaving that 250 kilodalton to achieve the final 12 or so proteins of size range from, you know, a few kilodaltons to uh, 60, 70 kilodaltons, each of the cleavage intermediates have a unique function. And so this way the virus can pack in a lot of enzymatic functions into a very small genome. However, they are still dependent on many, many host factors, okay? So they can't do everything themselves in order to replicate and make a virus inside the cell. And that's where my lab and many other labs around the world come into play, and we look for those host factors that these viruses need to replicate, to make themselves. Um, as Mark mentioned, these RNA viruses have very high mutation rates, uh, unlike DNA viruses because they, they miss the enzymatic machinery to correct the errors. And the RNA polymerases that are used to replicate the RNA have higher error rates than DNA polymerases. What does that mean practically? 
that means that you get a lot of diversity. You get a lot of variety in RNA viruses in relatively short amounts of time, which then gives you the challenge of resistance to drugs and therapies that you don't often have with DNA viruses that have a more stable genome. So what does it mean practically? You can have a single virus infect a host uh, one cell, and result, that virus's progeny can have subtle variations, OK? Um, not quite species, but so-called quasi-species. So you can have a variety of the same virus in, the same, in one cell. Um, so all of this you know, results in evolutionist selection in short time scales, and which can lead to rapid emergence of resistance to therapeutics. So we're looking, not just in my lab, many labs around the world, alternative strategies to kill RNA viruses. And as I just said, we look to see for target host factors that, are, that RNA viruses need for replication. So my approach to this question uh, uh, really focused on this uh, process. Uh, remarkably, all of these single positive strand RNA viruses. And here I'm just listing the ones that infect humans. Many, many of these infect animals, plants. All of these viruses depend on membranes, membrane platforms for replication and assembly. And what these membranes are are membranes that are provided by the host. They can be the plasma membrane. They can be the endoplasmic reticulum. They can be the nuclear envelope. They can be the Golgi. It can be the TGN compartment. It can be enzymes, lysosomes. It varies. Uh, 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 not much, but there, there are variations. And, and I'll show you examples of that. These viruses are, these membranes, excuse me, are hijacked by the host cells, uh, by, from the host cells by these viruses, and then are um, re redesigned to make a platform with a unique lipid and protein composition, which aids the replication uh, and propagation of these viruses. And so that's sort of like the summary of my talk, is to, is to, um, is to find out what these unique factors, what's the unique design of these membranes? What, what's, uh, um, what are the components in these membranes that are unique? Um, uh, uh, important for replication. And do many of these viruses need the same factors to be on these membranes for replication? We'll, we'll see more as, as we get uh, through it. So I'm going to use the HCV life cycle cartoon here uh, just to give you uh, an overview of how these viruses replicate but in the cell, once they enter the cell. But it's really similar for you can pretty much draw the same thing for polio, for Coxsackie, for rhinovirus, for West Nile virus. There are a lot of similarities. Some important differences, but a lot of similarities. So for those of you who may not be familiar, all of these viruses taking HCV or hepatitis A, they come in, they bind to a receptor or a, a group of receptors, and they enter the cytoplasm of the host cell where then the genome is the RNA genome is then exposed to the cytoplasm. And as soon as that process takes place, that genome, that RNA genome, is translated by the host ribosomes into a polyprotein, one single long polypeptide, which is then processed by various proteases. Some of the proteases are built in to the polyprotein, so that it cleaves itself and some are taken from the host, and the host process does the processing. And then the proteins that are made from that uh, polyprotein processing are essentially two classes. The structural proteins that will make up the, the, the housing of the genome, where the capsid, the envelope, and then the replication machinery, the enzymes and the associated factors that will replicate the genome. So that second group of uh, proteins, the replication machinery, assembles on an intracellular membrane. So here, 
hepatitis C virus, for example, as well as hepatitis A, you'll see, use the membranes of the endoplasmic reticulum. They pick, they select a domain on the endoplasmic reticulum, they assemble on that domain, they form a little factory, and that factory replicates the genome, makes more of the positive strand RNA. Some of that RNA that's made gets fed back into this translation process and gets translated into more replication enzymes and more um, uh, uh, capsid and envelope proteins. Uh, some of it gets packaged with the, the proteins that were made into a nucleocapsid, which, if it's a virus with an envelope, buds out of the cell. In the case of hepatitis C virus, for example, the nucleocapsid that's assembled buds into the endoplasmic reticulum and is secreted out of the cell uh, by piggybacking on the secretory trafficking pathway. So it goes from the ER to the Golgi to TGN, and it's exported out of the cell. Um, so hepatitis A virus, for example, uh, which is uh, not considered to be an enveloped virus, just considered to have a nucleocapsid, that virus was recently shown um, by Stan Lee Lemon's group to actually bud in to an endosomal, to cellular endosomes, endosomal type structure, and then be secreted out of the cell via these endosomal membranes. So the virus that comes out, the hepatitis A virus that comes out, is actually in a little packet, a membrane-bound packet. And the membranes of that packet come from the host endosomal population. OK. So what do these things look like? Well, I'll show you some EM pictures. Hepatitis C virus replicates on the endoplasmic reticulum. And this is kind of a very poor EM picture, not taken by me, by another group. But it's called this membranous web. And you see these little vesicles, little tubular membranes. These are actually attached to the ER. So it's an outgrowth of the ER, sort of a specialized outgrowth of the ER on which you have all the hepatitis C replication machinery, including the polymerase, the NS5B polymerase, the NS5A uh, replication complex protein, the protease, and so forth. They're all within this membranous web, and the genome of HCV gets replicated on this membranous web. SARS virus, which is another positively strand RNA virus, uh, also replicates on membranes. And it also makes membranes. Its membrane platforms are derived from the endoplasmic reticulum. But they look very different than the HCV membrane platforms, at least by EM. So the SARS replication organelles are these um, double membraned structures and um, the cluster. Uh, inside would be the cytosol, outside would be the cytosol. And the replication machinery would be facing the cytosol at all times, so they could be here, they could be inside here. Bromo mosaic virus um, it also forms these replication organelles from the ER. And again, the replication machinery is assembled on the leaflet of the ER membrane that fa faces the cytoplasm. The polymerase and the various factors there, and the RNA gets synthesized within these uh, 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 to, um, tubular um, uh, well, invaginations of the, of the ER. Here's another example. Flockhouse virus uses the mitochondrial outer membrane uh, as a platform for replication. So the mitochondrial outer membrane uh, makes these invaginations or these saccules, and the replication machinery are within these saccules. And they have access to the cytosol through these pores. 
This is a picture we took of a, of a hepatitis A virus. The green fluorescence here, this is an antibody against the hepatitis A replication protein. And, and the red is the, an ER membrane marker. And you see it's sort of dotting all over the ER uh, on this. So the hepatitis A virus also replicates on the ER. So these are all the pictures I've showed you so far, taken either by us or by other groups, are fixed cells. What I would like to show you next is, in a live cell, the biogenesis, the formation of these replication platforms in, in real time. So for those of you who may not be familiar, so this is a, a cell, uh, a HeLa cell, that's expressing uh, a host factor, a host molecule, doesn't really, it's not really important what this host molecule is for the time being, but this host molecule is needed by the virus that's going to infect this cell in order to make the replication, uh, in order to replicate. And this host factor is going to be uh, hijacked to the two domains on the ER where this virus replicates. And the virus that I'm showing you here is, is, is poliovirus, but it could easily be hepatitis C virus as well. The very similar uses uh, uh, the ER domains for replication. So what we're going to do is we've taken this host protein that this virus needs, that poliovirus needs, we've tagged it with a red fluorescent protein, we've expressed it into the, in the cell, and then we're going to add the virus, and we're going to take images by confocal microscopy every minute or two minutes for the next several hours. And uh, hmm. why it does not show? I don't know. Okay. Can you help me in the back there? Why is this movie is not playing? Because it's playing here on the screen. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So I see the. Okay. It, it's a movie, but it's not playing when I have it in full screen mode like this. It's playing when. Uh... So if I get out of this and go into the PowerPoint, it says. Oh, we 
having sex with hepatitis C. What what is what, what is? You said that uh, uh, it, it goes it, it infects you via the gut, but right. replicates in the liver. Right. Is it replicated at all in the gut and parasites? <laughs> well, that's, that, that, that that that's the question I was asking. Going to ask yeah. you. I mean, there there is some data to suggest that it does, mm -hmm. um, but I I wanted to know if you have any no, evidence. I don't. I mean, I, I, I would be surprised if it didn't um, uh, uh, replicate in the gut. I mean, unless those cells are not expressing the gut dysbiosis. But I believe they do. But it's a good question. Yeah, I believe they do. But, it, but there's no reason why it's not replicated. Polio, for example, also replicates in the gut and then passes. Does anyone else have a question during this uh, intermission? Okay. Well, well, I mean, I can just sort of talk while and maybe show the, you should, the, uh, uh, the uh, movie. So, what do you think? Uh, uh, some of you it. may be thinking, you know, uh, why the human membrane okay. is called replication? Is it working now? No. Oh, okay. You know what I'll do? This is what I'll do. Okay. I'll just copy and paste it to the desktop and then play it as a as a movie there. So. Just give me a second. I think this should work. Wow, it's already 525. Yeah. Too bad because I have a lot of movies. <laughs> you know, that's what we do. That's our bread and butter. We just take movies of viral infection. So it's too bad if I can't get to show you the the viral infection in real time. So okay, well, let's talk about some of you may be wondering or should be wondering, why would a virus need to replicate on a membrane? Right? I mean, let me ask you this. Why do you think a virus would need to replicate on a membrane? Why are membranes why not do everything in the cytosol? I, I don't need to. Uh, you do okay. Oh, like okay. What, so let me ask you this. Any, any ideas? Any ideas of why you think a virus would want to replicate on a membrane? Any thoughts? Yeah? To hide from the immune system. Remember, it's already in the cell. It's replicating inside the cell. So in a way, it's already hidden from the immune system. But why? Why replicate on a membrane within the cell? Right. Why not just use the cytosol of the cell to replicate? I, I guess if you use the brain many parts, you have the... Right. The so that, that's sort of the leading idea, right. right, what Mark said. When a virus goes into a cell and is translated into those proteins, all of those proteins have to find each other in order to get replication to get going. And remember, they're in an environment where they're in a minority. There's a lot of host proteins around. So they got to find each other and come together and form a little factory and get going. That appears to be easier to do if some of the proteins are membrane associated. Okay? Um, basically, that sucks these proteins onto a platform, and then their diffusion gets limited to only the two-dimensional space, the plane of the membrane. As opposed to if they were in the cytosol, they would have to move around in three dimensions in order to find each other. So that's one idea that um, is, is thought uh, uh, to benefit the vi virus. Another idea that we, I mean, we have evidence for is that the actual lipids within these membranes are cofactors for um, uh, 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 the enzymatic reactions that result in RNA synthesis. 
that are cofactors in, um, in they position these proteins, the viral proteins, on the membrane in certain orientations that allow that viral protein to prime viral RNA synthesis to elongate RNA. So really, they, they help direct the viral proteins into conformation. Okay, and in the cytosol, it would be more difficult to do that. So that's that's the idea of where the the um, one one role for why the lipids uh, are important. Okay, um, there's another movie here that I'm not going to be able to show you, but the point of this movie is that what we found, and 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 after us, other labs in, around the world have have also uh, found, is that these viruses on the left. Um, polio, Coxsackie, Rhino, Echo, Aichi virus, which is sort of an emerging uh, virus in Southeast Asia um, that causes uh, enteric disease, Enterovirus 71. All of these viruses, which use the ER membrane um, to replicate on, all cause the ER membrane to become highly enriched in a type of uh, lipid called PI4P, which stands for phosphatidyl inositol for phosphate lipid. Okay. And all of these enzymes um, enhance the production of this lipid on those membranes on which the, their replication enzymes are assembled and replicating. Okay. Sorry, did you have a question? Okay. Um, so what this movie was going to show you is, uh, is a cell that's expressing a reporter for this lipid. Okay. This is an uninfected cell. This reporter is in green. Normally, the, the, in an uninfected cell, you find this lipid in this compartment, which is the Golgi, trans-Golgi network. And you also find it at the plasma membrane. It's not so visible here. And what you will see, what you would have seen, is that um, during infection with these viruses, these, um, these, uh, Organelles start appearing all over the cytoplasm. They're actually associated with the ER, and they're glowing green with this reporter, which says to us that they are containing the PI4 phosphate lipid. What we discovered is that hepatitis C virus also does the same thing. What you're seeing here is a cell, a single cell. Here's the nucleus. Okay, and all these spots, these fluorescent spots, are NS5A labeled. These spots that you see are all domains of the ER. They're, they are that membranous web wh whose EM picture that you saw. Okay, so little domains of membranous web on the ER, and they're chock full of NS5A, okay, which is one of the replication proteins of uh, HCV. And if we come in and use a reporter that's going to detect the PI4P lipid, we see that all of those spots that have NS5A, in other words, that where the replication of the HCV virus happens, are chock full of this PI4 phosphate lipid. Okay? So we can add to this list also hepatitis C virus. Okay? So this is a panviral lipid. Okay? That is present on the replication platforms of all these viruses plus hepatitis C virus. And furthermore, uh, Ralph Badenschlager in Germany and, and colleagues, as well as other groups, have shown the presence of this PI4P lipid within the livers of hepatitis C patients. Okay, So this is an uninfected patient's liver stained with an antibody to PI4P. This is an infected patient's liver, chronically infected patient's liver, and the PI4P lipid uh, lights up in this area, which also lights up with NS5A. So that's the, this is the lipid, this phosphatidyl inositol for, uh, uh, phosphatidyl inositol for phosphate lipid, and it comes from the phosphorylation of this parental lipid, phosphatidyl inositide. And these are host lipids, okay? So, and what converts this to this is a phosphorylation on the four position of this ring. And that phosphorylation is done by a kinase 
that's part of his family, phosphatidylinositol 4 kinases. When we look during HCV infection or, or polio or Coxsackie or any of those viral infections and we measure the bulk levels of PI4 phosphate in the cells, we see a six-fold increase, sometimes more, in PI4 phosphate levels. So there's a huge increase in production of this, of this lipid, um, which you know, suggests that this kinases are somehow being activated or harnessed by these viruses in order to generate the lipids. It's not the virus that can, the, the virus doesn't have its own machinery to generate that lipid, so it must be using the, the, the host kinase, we, we, we thought. And this kinase family, just short called, um, uh, abbreviated as PI4 kinase, comes in four flavors in mammalian cells, a three alpha, three beta, two alpha, and two beta. And this is just the immunofluorescent staining pattern. Uh, and they, they all make the same end product. They all convert PI to PI4 phosphate, but these enzymes are found in different places in the cell. The PI4 kinase 3 beta uh, is found at the Golgi. The 2 beta is also at the Golgi. The 2 beta and the 2 alpha can also be present on endosomes. The 3 alpha and the 2 alpha are present at the plasma membrane and the, and the ER. So they're distributed among the various subcellular compartments. When we look to see with those viruses, are there any PI4 kinases that are being hijacked to those replication compartments in order to make the PI4 phosphate lipid, we saw that the majority of them hijacked one flavor of the PI4 kinase family, the PI4 kinase 3 beta. So this is an uninfected cell stained with an antibody to PI4 kinase 3 beta. Again, you see typically at the Golgi T uh, TGN area concentration of this enzyme, uh, which gives you that baseline level of PI4 phosphate. As you infect with polio or rhinovirus or echovirus, you start seeing these replication organelles forming at the ER, and you um, and all of those sites have. Uh, PI4 kinase enzyme on them, okay? And so the, the one important thing to remember is the PI4 kinase 3 beta levels in the cell is not changing. So it's not like the virus is inducing the production of more PI4 kinase enzyme. It's just recruiting the existing enzyme to these domains of the ER where that enzyme then produces the PI4 phosphate lipids. And what's really neat is that there's a single viral protein for, um, uh, that's virally encoded, the 3A protein uh, uh, in polio, in Coxsackie, in rhino, um, in enterovirus. If you just express this viral 3A protein alone in cells without there being any other virus, this protein is sufficient to hijack the PI4 kinase 3 beta to the membranes where the protein is localized. So just take this 3A protein, express it off a plasmid in a cell. You have two cells here, one cell here, one cell. This cell is expressing the 3A protein. And if you look in the cell where 3A is expressed, you have a lot more PI4 kinase 3 beta on those membranes than you do in the cell that's not expressing the 3A protein. And it's remarkably uh, specific, this hijacking of, uh, of this 3 beta uh, enzyme by 3A by the viral 3A. If you look at the 3 alpha enzyme or the 2 alpha enzyme or the 2 beta enzyme, their levels don't change on the membranes when 3A is present at those membranes. So it's really going after this 3 beta flavor of that PI4 kinase family. And what's even more remarkable is in HCV, and this was work done by Barnschlager's group again, the homologue of this 3A protein is the NS5A protein. This is for hepatitis C virus, and that does essentially the same thing. It hijacks the PI4 kinase and enhances the production of PI4 phosphate lipids during infection. So there are inhibitors that block these PI4 kinases, and there's an inhibitor called PIK93, which is very selective for the PI4 kinase 3 beta flavor of that PI4 kinase family. 
And if we look at the replication, in this case of poliovirus, we're just measuring poliovirus RNA levels in cells, just with a vector control and different concentrations of this PIK93 drug, you see that it's a quite, it's pretty effective inhibitor of replication. And similarly for hepatitis C virus, if you take cells infected with hepatitis C virus and you express a dead version of the PI4 kinase, a kinase dead version of the PI4 kinase enzyme, or you overexpress in these cells this molecule called SAC1, which is a phosphatase that brings PI4P back to PI, you significantly inhibit the replication of hepatitis C virus. So just by perturbing the lipids on that membrane platform, so we're not directly attacking the viral machinery, like the drugs that, uh, that um, uh, Mark mentioned, just by perturbing the lipids on those membrane platforms, we can significantly inhibit the replication of these viruses. And again, it's a sort of a pan-viral inhibitor. Some of you may be wondering, or should be wondering, well, maybe the cells are dying. That's why you're not getting the virus to replicate. Well, that's not the case. So when you knock down this PI4 kinase beta from the cells, or you treat with the drug, and we've done now you know, several weeks of treatment, there's no effect on cell viability. Do you guys have any ideas of why there might not be any effect on cell viability? Any thoughts? When we block this enzyme in the cell, why do you think the cell still survives? I mean, it's obvious why the virus does not survive, because it needs this one particular enzyme. But any thoughts on why the? Yes, exactly. So that's, that's our current uh, sort of leading hypothesis, is that the, the other three forms of this enzyme, which all pr produce the same product, can compensate. Yes? No, no, go ahead. Yeah, so, yeah. Sure. So what's your name? Sorry. Tara. Tara was asking the question, uh, can the virus, can there be viruses that adapt and use different forms, different other family members of the, of the PI4 kinase? So hepatitis C virus actually looks like it uses both the three alpha and the three beta forms. And it seems to depend on the genotype. Yeah, so that's a good, a good question. Yeah. And there may be some resistant forms of other viruses that are emerging that are going to be depending on the other, the other family members. Yeah. Yeah. Other polymorphisms. You mean in the PI4 kinase? It hasn't really been looked at to see whether there are any polyforms, polymorphisms in the in these genes. No, it hasn't been looked at. Yeah. range of uh, six log, but, but we do see individuals that, that have, can have quite low viral levels so that who, are, who are chronically infected. And yeah. we've always thought maybe they're on their way to clearing or, or they, uh, you know, or they're cirrhotic yeah. or they have some other explanation, well, this, but I mean, this, this could, could be, be this, right. th Yeah, exactly. This could be, I don't think anybody's, as far as I know, nobody's looked at that. Yeah. But definitely, yeah, it could be. Mm -hmm. It could be. Um, I, I'll give you sort of something related to that. Poliovirus replicates uh, tremendously well in gut enterocytes. And those cells have very high levels of PI4 kinase 3 beta. Um, so it could have something to do with the, the, the replication levels. So just in the interest of time, I'm going to just sort of wrap it up. What does this PI4 phosphate lipid do? I alluded at the beginning that it helps potentially these viral proteins orient themselves on the membrane 
um, in, in a particular orientation and helps these viral proteins come together on the membrane to form a productive replication complex. So we actually have evidence for this, for this molecule. So the, this is the RNA polymerase for poliovirus. Um, and uh, uh, this RNA dependent RNA polymerase uh, has these domains, the fingers, thumb, and, and palm domains. Doesn't really matter for the purpose of this talk. Um, it's a pretty conserved enzyme. So uh, and, uh, the NS5B in hepatitis C um, uh, is remarkably similar in, in many ways to this uh, uh, RNA polymerase. Hepatitis A virus RNA polymerase is almost identical to this uh, to this polymerase. Uh, this polymerase for, for the enteroviruses like polio and Coxsackie and, and rhino is a soluble protein. And this soluble protein, however, has to attach to the membrane in order to become ap active and replicate. What we found is that this enzyme, this RNA polymerase, has a unique binding site for PI4 phosphate lipids. So if we take this protein, purify it, and then incubate it on a strip, on nitrocellular strip with different types of lipids, and ask which lipid does it bind to, it really only binds well to PI4 phosphate and, and doesn't bind to PI5 phosphate or other uh, derivatives like PIP2 or PIP3, uh, which you might think have even more negative charge on them than PI4 phosphate. So it's, if it's just a sort of a charge interaction that it, it would interact with more. But it seems to like PI4 phosphate. So what we're thinking is that this polymerase is using the PI4 phosphate to dock itself on a membrane in a particular orientation in order to carry out RNA synthesis. So future studies in the lab, just last two studies, so last two slides, uh, we're looking for other lipids that might be panviral again in order to come up with more therapeutic targets and look at the harnessing pathways by which these other lipids are, are, are accrued there. So um, for example, one of the things we found is cholesterol. So in these replication platforms, in addition to PI4 phosphate, all of these viruses seem to share a need for cholesterol. So this is a, a single cell imaged by a fancy microscope called super-resolution microscopy. This here is one of these replication platforms. And, um, and here's another one. The green is a label for cholesterol, and the red is a label for PI4 phosphate. So in, within this one replication platform, you see this sort of patches of cholesterol within the sea of PI4 phosphate. And if we come in here with antibodies to label the viral proteins, you'll see the viral proteins docked on these cholesterol patches uh, within the sea, sea of PI4 phosphate. And cholesterol also seems to be really important for the replication when we take cholesterol away from those membranes, extract it out, we inhibit replication, and if we add cholesterol back, we promote replication. And again, getting back to this poliovirus and the, the gut enterocytes, those cells are not only highly enriched in PI4 kinase beta, but are also a major site for dietary cholesterol absorption in the body. So we think that it's a perfect lipid milieu for these um, enteric viruses. For, uh, replicating. So I'll just end there um, and just take questions. I think that's, that's, I'm sorry I couldn't show the movies, but if any of you want to come, and I have them playing here. I'll take this off so that it's not. Um, but any of you have any questions other than the ones 